Hi guys, I'm Ben. I'm the guy who's normally found behind the camera here on History of Violence. And today we're talking with Smudge from Redcoat Apparel to hear about his story from Herrick 7. My name's Smudge. I served 11 years with the British Army between 2001 and 2011, six of which was with uh, uh, 473 Special OP Battery. During my time with 473, I conducted two tours of Afghanistan, Op Eric 7 and Op Eric 11. So since leaving the military, I went out to Iraq, uh, spent a year out there working for the US, uh, working for the, for the US Department of Defense um, on reconstruction contracts and following on from that, I then went on to commercial contracts working for a client within the oil industry. Being, being away from the military and, and sort of being in that environment, it, it was kind of good for my head at that time. Um, I, I enjoyed being away, I enjoyed uh, being in theatre, you know, the buzz of being out there and, and doing the job, so to speak. Coming back from tours of Herrick and then getting back into normal camp everyday life was just boring and mundane um, you know you, you're trying to get out of that sort of how can I put it that routine of yeah, polishing your boots which every soldier good soldier should do but getting out of that routine and then uh, you know just trying to be in the thick of it all the time trying to be you know being on it been in that state of mind of, you know, the adrenaline and, yeah, it was kind of chasing something. During my time with 473, um, the first operational tour I went out on was Herrick 7. Um, on this particular tour, we, we deployed with uh, the Yorkshire Regiment as part of the Brigade Reconnaissance. The Brigade... The Brigade Reconnaissance was essentially the eyes and ears of, of the Brigade. So we were a Brigade asset and it was a, a reconnaissance role. So we would go out and um, come into contact with, with the enemy or find the enemy uh, via whatever means necessary. On this particular tour, I was um, part of Air Troop, um, which was uh, one of three essential platoons for the Brigade Reconnaissance, we had A, B and C troop. So at that time, uh, the Brigade Recce was, uh, was a mounted uh, formation. Um, we utilised Wimmicks and Pinsgowers, um, all chopped down, lightweight, um, with heavy weapon systems um, to deal with any threats that we came across. Um, so the generic loadout would be 50 cals, GPMGs, automatic grenade launchers, and then personal weapon systems, support weapons, etc. We also had um, 81 millimeter mortars. So we had uh, an integral um, indirect fire asset that we could utilize at any time to, uh, to bring it to bear should we come under you know, heavy resistance from Taliban fighters. Um, we also had uh, Javelin, uh, which is an anti-tank weapon system. Uh, we, not that we were c coming up against any armoured type force, but, um, you know, bunker systems, Taliban were very renowned for, for utilising overhead, like bunkers with overhead protection, um, and Javelin would get rid of it fucking straight away. The main focus for this particular tour um, essentially was a build-up to Op Mar Karadad, which was Op Snakebite, um, and that was that all that encompassed the uh, the reconnaissance of the Muzikala area, which was heavily defended by Taliban at that time. Um, so we would essentially do the reconnaissance phase, and then we would do the kinetic phase, which came later um, in that tour. So we got we got given the task to. Uh, to move from Bastion to Musicala and the initial op order was to to head north, establish a footprint uh, 
west of Musicala and then conduct probing operations um, into the green zone. Uh, it was basically recce by force. So we'd go in, come into contact with the enemy, um, have a bit of a fist fight, gauge, gauge the enemy's strengths and weaknesses, weapon systems they were using, enemy forces, things like that, just specific generic things. And then we would then extract, um, collect the information and then look look into other areas. When the commanders came back, we had a set of order, like formal set of orders again. Um, we were updated that we were going to move north um, via the eastern side of Musicala uh, by vehicles. We were then going to league her up and then as day broke, we were going to go dismounted from the vehicles into an area called Katz, Katzada. Uh, which was on the eastern side of the Wadi and just south of Mount Doom. And it was quite a, a hotbed for in, insurgent activity. The op was to push in there, engage atmospherics, and if come into contact with enemy, then deal with the situation at hand. So that evening, we all geared up. It must have been about one in the morning, something like that. We jumped in the vehicles and we headed out under under protection of darkness, wearing night vision equipment. So we came out of DC, we headed east up a dry riverbed, and then after about 10k, we then headed north through various Afghan villages and desert type terrain. When, when we got to the vehicle Liga point, uh, we pulled in uh, in formation to support each other um, with with our weapon capabilities, and we pulled in in a, in a way that we were in dead ground to the village that we were going to be moving into. So there was a, from what I remember, there was a reverse slope, and we were, we were just down from it. So the, the villagers couldn't see us. They shouldn't have shouldn't have heard us that night. There was no dogs barking. We we moved in there, but. What I do remember, it was fucking cold. It was really cold. The, the, the ground was hard. It was frost, frosty. Um, I remember driving and having every bit of warm kit on me. Like, it was fucking freezing. It must have been about minus 10, minus 15-ish. Um, for that time of year, it was, like, really, really cold. And we'd just come round from probably one of the coldest winters in Helmand on record for the last 50 years. So, yeah, it was really cold. So, must have been about four in the morning. Day was breaking. Air troop would be up first. So, we dismounted, got our belt kit on, got all of our radios prepped for dismounted roll, and then we got we got in position. As soon as we got the word, we stepped off, and then we dropped off um, a cliff type feature, and it had like a footpath, and we moved down the, the cliff face and headed in towards the village. So atmospherics of that day is really quiet. With it being cold, villagers, they'll stare in the, in the compounds in their, in their housing and they don't really come out during this period. Especially, I mean, there's no crops to grow and they're, they're confined within their own ways. It's very, very small movement. Move through the village, the, the plan was to head out west from the vehicle Liga position, head west, hit the, hit the wadi, the dry riverbed, head north a couple of k's and then come back on ourselves. So kind of doing a loop um, throughout this village. And throughout this whole period, there was no icon, there was nothing, nothing popped up. It was a very quiet patrol. We weren't expecting it. We were expecting to come into heavy contact with the enemy and we just never got it. Um, so, yeah, we, we headed back to the vehicles. Must have been around about 10 o'clock off the top of my head. We, we were climbing the cliff face to get back into the vehicle leaguer point and we counted all of our patrol members coming back through. Um, and when we got up there, everyone was fucked, took all of our body armour and that off um you know started 
admin and ourselves, having some food, drinking some water, getting ready to move back to the DC for our next task. And, and uh, I remember the sun coming up and it was one of these days where we'd never really had sun for a while. And I just remember the sun coming up and it was feeling nice and warm and it was just good to feel that sun on your body. And uh, like morale was lifted instantly, so to speak. I remember having a boil in the bag, I had my food and it was like, right, let's get ready to fucking move off. Everybody jumped in the vehicles, everybody got ready. So word had come down comms, order a march, so air troop would push off first um, and then B troop, then C troop. Danny K's vehicle was the first vehicle moving off, uh, being, being the lead vehicle. And Danny's vehicle was about, I'd say, no more than 10, 15 metres away. And he did like a little loop to get himself pointing in the right direction to move off. And as he turned the vehicle and came back on himself, and fucking, all I remember is the loudest explosion I've ever fucking heard in my life within close proximity just fucking went up. The explosion happened as I was looking at Danny's vehicle and everything happened in slow motion. I kind, I kind of like put my head down to protect myself from the debris. There was fucking kit and everything being strewn all over. I remember, I remember seeing the 50 cal being thrown off. Um, there was kit thrown 20 meters past our, our position. And there was just blackness, like dust and the what, whatever it was being thrown into the air. That, that, it was shield and uh, visuals of the vehicle crew at that time. You couldn't really see anything, but it just felt like it was going on forever. I remember putting my head down, looking up, see if I could see them. Couldn't see them, put my head back down. Shit was coming down. The bonnet came down on our vehicle um, with loads of ammo tins still attached to it. So it was quite a bit of weight. And if it wasn't for the roll bar in the middle, you know, we would have took the full impact of that. But the roll bar saved us. Um, so I put my head down. And then as, as it all came to, and we could see the vehicle crew, the vehicle had been thrown sort of 180 facing towards us. And it was missing the, uh, the left-hand side, the front left-hand side of the Wimmick. Um, I could see Danny... Coxie, but I couldn't see Troy at this time. Troy was in the gunner's gunner uh, compartment. Um, and initial thought was, grab my fucking med kit and run over. So I grabbed my med kit and I made my way towards Danny. Fucking about two metres away from the vehicle, the boss shouts over, smudge, stop fucking mines. And straight away I fucking froze. I froze in spot. And... All that was going through my head was, I need to get Danny, I need to get Danny. And I'm looking at Danny, and the first thing I see is Danny's trying to stand up, but he can't because his legs are fucked. Um, and then Coxie's got, like, engine oil and everything in his face, so it's burning him. And he's, he's like, whinging about his eyes. He's, like, kicking off about his eyes. <laughs> Fucking magically, like, one of the weirdest things that's ever happened is, like, Troy just comes around the corner shaking himself off and he's like fuck me you know he, but he, he survived he got thrown from the turret and Troy, Troy survived the fucking initial blast but he got thrown from the turret just behind our position into a bit of dead ground <laughs> and he just magically walked on around the corner from where he was I just remember being upside down just like in a state of unconsciousness I just remember my body I was like I'm upside down and I don't know why. And I just fucking, I landed in like a handstand position because I put my hands up and I landed, my hands bent right back and then I landed on some rocks. And the only thing that stopped me breaking my neck was my, the lip of my helmet and top of my body armor plate just stopped me cracking my C-spine on these rocks. So whack, handstands whack, and I rolled out of it onto my feet like a fucking superhero. <laughs> so I rolled out of it. Stood up and just thought, what the fuck was that? And I looked, because I was facing the wrong direction. I turned around and I looked 
and that was our fucking vehicle and it was just like toppled over like that black smoke coming from it shit everywhere the 50 cow went <laughs> on the fucking floor with a box of link just sprawled out all over the place and i heard someone shout mines i was like we're in a fucking minefield i was like looking around i was like oh my fucking god and i pulled my camera out and i must have been in some kind of shock because i was just i remember just standing there just filming everything Filming sea troop up on the high ground, filming my fucking vehicle. And I put it that way and I was like, we're in a fucking minefield. Minimal movement, collect the one to one way. Put them up here, only your one, only about to take one shot. One yard. So Chim, Chim guys, we're up to, uh, up to Danny. And straight away started dealing with him um, and getting him into a comfortable position. Turns out he, uh, all of his lower half of his legs had fucking been smashed. Um, he couldn't, he physically could not walk. Um, Coxie, he, like I said, he had engine oil in his face, but he didn't have any brakes or anything. Um, so we were trying to tend, tend to that. Um, then a couple of more lads who were on the vehicles with Valens just started clearing the immediate area, getting the other lads back to the vehicles and then just coordinating security whilst we were doing all, everything. Um, ICOM chatter had started piping up. Um, they started saying things like they're stuck in the minefield, um, let's hit them now, um, you know, and straight away we're on the back foot. We can't move and we're in a bit of dead, dead ground. There's potentially they could move in into positions of or, or, like overwatch uh, or elevated positions to then take us on. So that, that became quite concerning. The JTACs in the BRF started going to work. Um, call had went out about the mine strike and We'd, uh, we'd had an update that Mert was on the way. During this period, we took, we took time out to then consolidate everyone, clear a pathway between each individual troop. So the Valor men pushed out and created a route between the, two tro uh, between the three troops. Um, and then we started moving all the strong equipment, all the personal equipment, all the weapon systems, all, pulling what ammunition we could off this vehicle um, and try and salvage what we could. So we collated it all at a B Troops location, which was the, sort of the command element. So we got all the equipment to the Sergeant Major's vehicle, moved all the casualties uh, up to that location as well. And at that time, I remember being with Yam Yam and we both had an end on the 50 cal. It was about fucking 200 metres humping this fucking 50 cal uphill towards Sergeant Major's vehicle. And when we got there, I remember dropping it, saying bye to the lads, you know, I'll catch you, I'll catch you in a bit. And I turned round and uh, sort, sorting some other bits out. Mean, meanwhile, JTAX had piped up saying, right, there's a heli coming in. Everybody needs to get onto that fucking vehicle and we need to get the casualties out. So it was, we forgot about movement of equipment at that time and we just threw all the casualties onto the vehicle and it was like, quick, get the casualties up there. They're, they're getting taken now. And me and Yam Yam started walking off. Everyone jumped on. Daz jumped into the driver's seat and literally fucking, it wasn't even five seconds from moving away from that position. Daz had moved off. And straight away, fucking another mine strike. <laughs> Bang, we fucking hit another one. And I just remember, I remember just blacking up and cracking my head on the fucking bar above my head. And then just falling. And I, and I fell into something and I just curled up into this fucking ball. And I was just, I was just, I, I thought something's gonna fucking land on me in a minute. 
that the vehicle is in the air and it's going to come down and it's going to fucking squash me. And it never came. And I just laid there in this crater and I'd, I'd, I'd rolled out, I'd fell out of the vehicle into the fucking crater where the mine was. And I was laying there and I opened my eyes and I was looking around and the fucking, the, the pins gal was just on its side. Danny was on the floor, still on the, like, falling off the stretcher, covered in cargo, ammo boxes, fucking these huge uh, Thomas bins with all the rations and boxes of rations and just heavy shit all over his legs, all over his smashed legs. And I thought, I went, went, Danny! And I just, um, it was on fire as well. I remember seeing Danny's face, just like, just looking at me like, his face was just white. And he was looking at me like, because he was on morphine as well. So he was in shock. So I jumped up and as I turned, I ran to Danny and I turned and I just saw, I think, Chimp and Eddie Mayhar just, just run straight past me. And I turned, I could see his like bin bag thing, like way out there and it was rustling. It's fucking Daz. He he. It went off underneath his underneath his seat and blew him into the air, and he just landed like well away from the vehicles. And the guys have just like, you know, it, when you see guys just running through a minefield for other people, something very brave about that. And it's you don't hear of it that often. But it, so so that, you know, there's a, a few others joined. I think Dave Seymour jumped in. And they ran across and they got, they got to Daz. And I remember just looking at them and they were doing this mad, it looked like a, pl- a mad plant potting ceremony where they were just rotating around doing CPR on him. But Danny had to be dealt with. So, but this, is, this was after. And as we got to the vehicle, there was loads of kit everywhere. Um, I could see Danny crawling off, obviously with his legs. He, he, he'd had fucking copious amounts of, uh, of morphine. So God knows what, what he was going through at that time. And then Troy was dusting himself off and myself, Eddie, who'd got there at that time, and Yam Yam, we proceeded towards the vehicle, picked the casualties up and then sat them down in a location where we could make them comfortable. Um, I remember Eddie uh, jumping over a certain part of the vehicle with a fire extinguisher because the vehicle had caught fire and uh, he put that out there was fucking all sorts on there there was, there was like explosives for breaching grenades ammunition it was the sam major's vehicle so he was he was in charge of resupply so to speak so we had loads of kit on there that fucking would have went up i remember tending more towards Danny. <laughs> and I remember Danny saying, dude, if you fucking step on my knees one more time, I'm gonna fucking drop you. But, man, I wasn't touching his knees. I wasn't touching his legs or stepping on his legs or anything. You know, I'd, I, I was trying to fucking see to him, but he was in that much pain. He thought I was fucking climbing on his legs. So out, out of this whole second mind strike, uh, the casualties um, never, sustained further damage so to speak the uh danny danny was it still had his legs broke uh, troy was okay but later found out he had a broken wrist um coxie he was having problems with his eyes still didn't sustain any further injuries and there was a couple of uh sort of walking casualties in and around from in and around that vehicle uh, we sat them down and we, we proceeded to treat them. So in total, we, we had around about seven or eight casualties. Boss put a shout out. He, he wanted to know what the casualties were, um, what level they were. We, we had like one, one cat here, which was Daz. Um, Daz had been blown stricken from the vehicle. Turns out uh, the mine had gone off underneath his wheel. So people who know Pinsgowers, you're pretty much driving and commanding on top of the wheel um, and all we had at that time was ballistic matten so it was just sort of materialized uh, kevlar sheeting which we were sat on at that time um, and further reports came down from the guys who were tending to daz chimp was one of them was that he'd lost his one of his legs and he was unconscious 
So he was a, he was cut here, unresponsive, and they were working with him. We proceeded to work with the other guys, just sit him down, calm him down. Danny was going into a bit of shock. He was feeling cold, so all we did was get a sleeping bag out for him and get it over him. And he was just asking for more morphine, which we couldn't give him any more. Um, instantly, what happened when that mine went off, the, the heli was virtually, or the Chinook, was virtually wheels down on the back. And as soon as the mine went off, it just fucking took off and went, and went into a circle. And they requested another bomber of that immediate area, which we did. It all happened so quickly. Um, we got all the casualties loaded up on the stretchers, replanned for the Chinook to come back in, and we manhandled instead of driving up to the HLS. So we manhandled all the casualties. I remember looking at Paul, the BSM, and I was like, oh, how's Daz? And he just had that look. It was just that look he gave us as if like, nah, he's not fucking good, mate. Which sucked fucking big time. Um, I remember stretchering Danny. There was me and Yam Yam at the Danny. And we took him past B Troop's vehicles. And then Daz was coming up. And you could instantly see that he's fucking in a bad way. Like... Um, Got all the casualties up to the HLS, loaded them up, and again, it was a fist bump, fucking, mate, we'll fucking catch you later, type thing. And then we we exited the the, uh, the heli, and they took the casualties back to Bastion. I remember getting to the back of the helicopter, and they, Daz, was, Daz they, I think they kept a pulse going through Daz. For, for the whole time until the Mert, until the Mert landed. But when they got on a heli, they put him on a helicopter and then Danny, they put Danny in a helicopter. But by this point, we had like numerous casualties because it wasn't just me, Coxie and Danny on that second vehicle. There was Daz, there was another chap and another chap and another chap. I can't remember they were because they were, they were the, um, the Yorks blokes. And they, they, they'd been, they were on the wagon as well. And they, they hit the mine with us. And they suffered some injuries. They had like fucking sprained ankles and busted their arms up and stuff like that. I remember being the last person onto a helicopter and I sat down. And I just looked and Danny was there. They were cutting through his fucking trousers and Daz was there and they had a fucking oxygen mask on him and they were just doing CPR. And I just thought there's nothing I can fucking do. And there's always other guys just sat around holding their fucking legs and stuff like that. And I remember looking at the tailgate and seeing the BRF just looking at us. Like try, just like, looking at these two smoking vehicles. And all my kit was on the women, because I was just fucking destroyed. And all I had was my softy jacket that I was wearing, my trousers, my boots, my jumper underneath. And I had my iPod, my headphones in my, in my breast pocket, because I was just listening to that when we were doing nothing. And I just pulled my headphones out, I put them in, I just pressed play, and we just, I was listening to Muse, Citizens and Raised, remember that vividly. And just looking out the back tailgate as we lifted off, just listening to my fucking iPod, while this just chaos was just going on behind me, with Danny and Daz. And uh, we took off and went back to Bastion. During that evening, uh, commanders had called in all the lads and uh, everyone got together and they announced that Daz had died in result of his injuries uh, when he got back to Bastion. Um, and it was, it sucked, it, it does suck. And it was our second death of that tour. Um, but yeah, Daz, Daz had died. Um, everybody else was fine. Uh, Danny was fine. Coxie was fine. Coxie eventually got brought back to us. He just got cleaned up after a couple of days in hospital, obviously shaking a bit. But he, he came back out to us and Grant um, spent a bit of time in Bastion with a cast on. He'd broke his arm. I think, I, I do believe he went back home um, off the top of my head. I don't know. I think he went back home had a bit of time off, but came back out and fucking started rocking it again. 